Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and today we're going to talk about why most patients with Retroflex stents don't need surgery. Um, I did a Facebook Live on this, and regrettably, I think for some patients, the slides weren't advancing, so I'm trying to get this out there as quickly as I can so that they can uh, see all of this, because I think this is an important topic. So this is the case that got us here. Um, as you can see on the left there, um, we've got a patient who's got pretty much everything, right? Um, it's a patient I did a telemedicine on. Um, you can see that that patient has uh, a little bit of retroflex dens. They've got uh, some compression of the anterior front of the spinal cord and medulla. They've got um, a Chiari going on. There's not a lot of CSF flow going through there because there's not a lot of room. And then you see uh, a, the white stripe in the middle of the spinal cord on the left there. And that white stripe in the middle of the spinal cord is in fact um, a syrinx. And so I will circle that, that's the syrinx. And then the patient gets a posterior decompression surgery um, and the syrinx is not there anymore. Um, but uh, after decompression, their symptoms increased. The symptoms didn't go away. Um, so all the structural stuff was fixed. We now have more room in there. CSF is probably flowing back and forth. Um, but, and the syrinx went away, but the symptoms continued. So, uh, what I want you to understand here is that some of these structural things that we think are a big deal actually aren't. And it's really important, don't shoot the messenger. This is my review of the medical literature. Um, and sometimes these sorts of uh, uh, lectures can anger patients because, and I understand why, right? Patients are desperate for help. And they've been told, for instance, they have a retroflex dens that if someone just goes in and repairs that, then everything will be okay. Um, and I want to make sure that you're hearing the other side of that argument, because the other side of that argument is that there's evidence that surgery is needed uh, and there's evidence that surgery shouldn't be done, uh, meaning something like a PICL might be a better fit. And it's my job to balance those two, um, to try to look at is the non-surgical approach better for this patient. So what is a retroflex dens? Um, it's a dens uh, that goes backwards, like the one on the right here. So that's this one here. So a retroflex dens is simply a dens or the C2 that rather than being upright and straight like the one on the left, goes backwards like the one on the right. And there's two different measurements that you can use, a clivoaxial angle, also called a clivocanal angle, and a cervical lordosis angle, also called the CLA. Those are two ways to try to see how far back the dens goes. Now, realize that if you've got a retroflex dens, your posture makes a tremendous difference. As you can see in the middle here, we have sort of a, a neutral posture. But if we go to the left with increased lordosis, that retroflexion, the amount that the dens comes backwards, gets worse. Uh, if we go to the right here with decreased curvature in the neck or decreased lordosis, that retroflexion gets better. So I've got patients all day long that come in like this because they are looking at their phones all day. Um, and if they've got a retroflex stens, it's much worse. But if they get their posture back to something like this, now we're talking because that's something they can modify to help a retroflex stens. So in adults without severe CCJ deformities, there is no difference in DENS retroflexion and asymptomatic controls versus patients. Now, that's what I found after looking at the peer-reviewed medical literature. Don't shoot the messenger. Um, and I'm gonna talk you through why that is. And it gets a little bit in the weeds, but it's critical to understand. So let's start with some definitions. The first definition is Chiari malformation. What is Chiari malformation? Uh, well, that's when the back of the brain tends to go below the little hole at the bottom of the skull called the frame and magnum. Now, there are lots of people walking around out there who have Chiari 0 and Chiari 1 without any symptoms uh, who are living normal lives. 
In fact, I'm going to give you um, a link at the bottom of this where you can see another video on that topic. Now, we'll also be talking a little bit about Chamberlain's line. Chamberlain's line is the idea that the dens migrates upwards and that can put pressure on the upper spinal cord and brain stem. And it's important to understand that there are severe CCJ abnormalities, things called basal invagination types one and two. That's gonna be in some of the slides, BI1 and BI2. But the vast majority of patients I evaluate for craniosurgical instability don't have anything like this. The vast majority of patients watching this video won't have anything like that. But if someone has something like this, this is clearly a surgical issue. So let's understand the research now based on CCI metrics. How do we determine whether or not we can make some measurement on MRI and that's likely to find someone that has symptoms, meaning that if we see that, we know that that's causing someone's symptoms so that we would want to operate on it. Well, it's the concept of data separation, right? You got two groups here. So we got the green folks over here. Those are the normal control patients with no symptoms. This is most of their, the range of their data. The little line represents the mean. Um, and we got the red people over here. Those are the folks uh, who have symptoms. Now we wanna see that separation in those two groups along these values, because if we don't have that separation then it's, we won't be able to tell who's who based on the numbers. Um, so we've got good separation on the top, but on the bottom here, you can see we've got really bad separation. In fact, there's so much overlap here that there's no way to tell based on the measurement who's who. Meaning if I draw a line at negative 0.1, well, that represents people in both groups. If I draw a line at zero, still both groups. I draw a line of plus 0.1, still both groups, plus 0.2, still both groups. So it's gonna be very hard with that kind of data um, to do anything with it. And so this is the paper we're gonna look at today that goes into this whole idea of multiple different metrics, including those that look at the amount that the DENS goes backwards or retroversion. So this is, there's lots of data here. You got the BI1s, the BI2s like I talked about but they were trying to figure out if they could take normal control patients and, and their symptomatic Chiari people and look at these numbers to try to see who was who. And when it comes to those uh, things that looked at the degree of retroversion, which is again, how far back that DENS goes, it's a total mess. You can't determine who's in which group. The greens who have no symptoms or the reds who have symptoms are almost identical here on the two things I have highlighted. That's Clivo canal angle. Remember that CXA or CCA looks at that degree of retroversion and the cervical or dosis angle or the CLA that looks at that degree of retroversion as well. So what does this tell us? It tells us that in adults without severe CCJ deformities, there is no difference in DENS retroflexion in asymptomatic controls versus symptomatic patients. In other words, you can't look at a retroflex dens on an MRI and decide that that's causing symptoms. And we all know that's probably true, right? We know that there's lots of patients out there that are born with retroflex dens. There was a large stretch of their life where they had no symptoms. But they had a retroflex dens. They didn't acquire their retroflex dens. Uh, but something changed, and then one day they had symptoms. So what changed? Uh, examples for us that we see quite a bit is new instability. They got in some sort of trauma, or they have hy they're hypermobile, hypermobile and they're getting older, so their ligaments are getting looser, and they've got new instability, and that's what changed. Or they changed their posture. We talked about that one. Or they have a spike in systemic inflammation. Let's say they have they had. COVID would dramatically increase that inflammation for a while or something else that spiked their inflammation and that caused that spiral um, and they just haven't been able to recover from that spiral. So we can then conclude that mild to moderate deformity alone doesn't cause symptoms. Important one to, to recognize. Uh, now, mild to moderate deformity plus instability 
can cause symptoms. But mild to moderate deformity, like a retroflex dens or a Chiari 0 or 1, without instability, no symptoms. So the best way to think of mild to moderate deformities like a retroflex dens or a Chiari 0 or 1 is by themselves, they're common in people without symptoms, they don't cause symptoms. But when you add an instability, they are like accelerant for symptoms. So they're adding the gasoline to the bonfire in that case because they are changes in anatomy that set you up for more symptoms if we add in instability. So if you want to know more about Chiari 0, Chiari 1, and CCI, which is a very similar lecture that goes into that literature, then this is the link for that. I'm going to put it down in the description below so you can get there. Um, and that's pretty much it. At the end of the day, it's important to realize that a retroflex dens by itself isn't a big deal. There's no reason to surgically take it out. But there may be a reason to try to fix instability that is causing the retroflex dens to cause symptoms. So that's a critical thing. And then this was supposed to be by uh, Facebook Live, and so it's got the Q&A. Obviously, I can't do any Q&A if I'm recording it. But thanks so much for watching. I know this is a little bit longer one. I went in a little, little bit more depth here, but this is a critical topic for patients to understand. Thank you.